and we're recording. So in this video I'd like to introduce tests and JUnit which is the testing framework that we're going to use in the project this term. Now you've already met JUnit in the video where I showed you how to create a Gradle project from scratch because I showed you how to create uh, a JUnit test file that Gradle could run and Gradle running it and producing the output. So for this video I'm just going to introduce it across the slides and we will see a bit more of JUnit as we look through the second tutorial solution um, shortly. So if we recall going right back to the beginning as we're working as a team developing some software we want to share these discrete working changes we don't want to share the brokenness in the middle while we're still editing things and things don't necessarily compile and the tests don't pass well if we're going to go from one snapshot make some changes and produce another working snapshot how are we going to know that we've got a working snapshot and so we need some tests we need some tests that are going to tell us not just this compiles but this does what you think it does this works now if we remember uh, we've got the initial revision and we added a shiny feature and we added a colorful feature and then oh I added a brilliant idea and uh, then I needed to revert my not so brilliant idea well ideally of course that brilliant idea that d didn't work um, well ideally if it broke the tests it wouldn't actually have got pushed in the first place I would have known that uh, actually the tests weren't passing that the code was broken and so I wouldn't have committed and shared that particular version it's possible though that actually my brilliant idea didn't break any of the tests it just turned out not to be such a brilliant idea later but let's ask this question how could I have known that the fourth commit broke everything before I committed it we need some automated tests for our code as well as an automated build and there is my um, uh, dodgy little sketch of our uh, policeman who's going to say oh that one did not work or if you recall going back a little while Jenkins the robot butler that is going to keep compiling and testing your code well this automated build has to have some tests in it for Jenkins to run to know whether things succeed or not and uh, so this is where JUnit comes in and JUnit is a testing framework that is very very popular uh, in the Java community and um, this shows you know a, a, a trivial test that doesn't really test very much um, so we, we've got the import org.junit.test so that we can have the at test annotation that's how we mark um, which methods uh, are tests we, we give them an at test annotation I've got import static org.junit.assert.star here that's to import this assert equals and here I'm saying assert equals with a message to put if the test fails wasn't three and here I'm saying the expected value is three and uh, I would like to check that the result of flooper.floop was three um, so if we kind of see what's going on here there is some setup I am calling some code I'm getting a result and I am checking is that result what I think it should be and that's kind of the basic pattern that a lot of tests go through um, now if you recall also in the Gradle video but worth mentioning it again here um, when you run the tests if I were to call this floop T um, well actually it might not run it might not be found if I was to call it just floop is it working it might not be found um, so when Gradle runs the test the test runner needs to scan the classes that are on the class path if you like uh, the, the classes that are available uh, to try to discover these tests that you've marked with it at test annotation but given all of the libraries that you've imported in your code there could be thousands of classes tens of thousands of classes to look through and that wouldn't be very efficient so the test runner looks for classes that have test uh, in the name at the beginning or the end so it'll, it'll look for test floop or floop test um, something else test and those are the classes it's going to check to see if they contain any uh, methods marked with a test annotation that need to be run as tests now the next uh, thing to mention a couple of other annotations to introduce you to one of them is at before 
and this is code that gets run before each test in this class. Ideally, our tests are somewhat independent um, of each other. And so ideally, you know, you, you set something up for this test and OK, and then you run that that test and you set it up. You're sort of ideally not relying on the particular order that the tests occur in within a class. However, um, if you do have some piece of setup that needs to be run once before any of the tests in this class, so this will get called before, uh, you know, if you've got three methods that have an at test annotation, this before will get called before each of them. Whereas this before class would only get called once before the tests that are in this class. And so those can get used for particular set pieces of setup that you might have. It may need be that you need to populate little pieces of data that are going to get called by the tests or various other set ac activities, linking things through to other modules or fake other modules, for instance. All right. So if that is the relatively simple structure that a test has, um, the next question I want to, uh, I guess, try to answer is this question of, well, OK, but what should I test? Um, and what data should I put in when I test? Uh, what things should I try? And the way I'd like you to look at this is to remember that we are trying to catch bugs. What we're doing when we write our test is we're trying to make it so that when we run the Gradle build, it will have the maximum likelihood of finding all the things that are wrong with our code so that we can fix it, rather than we give it out to the customer and then our customer complains about all the things that aren't working and we have to fix it and update our customers. Um, it is an awful lot more expensive to fix bugs after they've been gone out and been deployed um, than if you can catch them while they're still, uh, you know, closeted away in your development team. Ooh, thank goodness for that. The customer hasn't seen that. Their customers haven't had to deal with it. Their users haven't had to deal with it. Um, they're not going to have to do a redeploy and... Um, check that the, the redeployed system works with all of their systems etc just to fix this bug. So we're trying to catch bugs in our program. Now imagine that this is one class in our program but our program's not just going to be one class. We're going to have a class that's going to be talking to lots of other classes that we're also writing and those classes are going to be talking to other classes. So our program is going to look something more like this with whole bunches of different uh, clumps of classes talking to each other and various amounts of interlink interlinking between them. So if we're trying to catch bugs and suppose to begin with we go well I'm going to write the test that sees whether my code is working and you know I'm just going to have one test and I'm call it, going to call it the one big test and my test fails. Well, the next question I'm going to need to ask is, where's the bug? Well, it's somewhere in that lot, uh, which probably isn't very helpful to know. Um, there is an awful lot of that. So instead, how do we go about testing this? Well, we go about testing it piece by piece, which is called unit testing. This is where we test each of the components in isolation so that we don't have to try and work out okay was the t was the fault in this bit or was the fault in that bit we've got tests that sit around our particular units our classes our methods that are in in those classes and when they fail that tells us right there is a bug in that class and i can pretty much pin it down to the few lines that, are, that may be at fault and i can look at the test case and i can see oh that was the input and i can mentally step through the code and see oh yes i see what the bug was there yep i know how to fix that okay and so it's not such a great search exercise because the unit tests have pinned it down to a a very small part of the code however um, it may be that we have two classes that individually appear, according to their unit tests, to work perfectly well. But they need to talk to each other, and um, the class on the left is expecting to talk French, and the class on the right is expecting to talk German. Uh, or, you know, there is some incompatibility in the way these classes are operating. One class is making assumptions that do not hold in the other class, and so the errors are aren't identified by the unit tests and so what we also need to do is do things like test group by group 
where we're testing the interoperability of our classes um, with the other classes. And so um, this tends to be integration testing, testing components in combination. And you'll also see integration testing kind of you talked about at a larger scale when we talk about, you know, OK, we've built this system and we want to test that this program that we've developed interoperate correctly with the other programs that it needs to operate interoperate with and you'll also occasionally hear about system testing which um, again sometimes uh, sometimes used in a couple of meanings sometimes people mean okay that that's checking our program with all the surrounding programs in our company uh, sometimes system testing means well we actually need to test the software together with the hardware and so that's the system is the, the system involving the hardware as well OK, so that is in terms of we need to write um, quite a lot of unit tests, a smaller number of integration tests. And then at the end, we'll probably have quite a few that uh, we will have a, a, a smallish number that go end to end. They, they, they call this the, the testing pyramid. The, the largest numbers are of, of tests are at the smallest, the finest grain of detail, the unit tests. And then as you combine more things together, you have slightly fewer tests at each level. OK, so the when and the what of tests. Imagine we've been asked to write some piece of functionality. Um, well, let me uh, just highlight something in that. We have been asked to write some piece of functionality. And so the first thing I'm going to say is, ticket please, where is the issue describing the functionality that I am being asked to write. And so at the moment in your groups, you're, you're forming your groups and you're thinking of the functionality that you want to develop. And if we pop out to a web browser and we go to GitLab and if I was to go to the class project and to go to the issues, uh, we should see, well, there's not very many yet, but for instance, I've created an issue here that's called upload the starting code base, um, which has some stuff that I need to do. But so generally speaking, some feature, something that we are planning on developing is going to be documented somewhere. And one of the places that it's going to be tracked very often is in the issues database that gives us a place to write down details about it, say who's working on it, comment on it, um, talk about its progress, what milestone it's in, etc. Gives us ways of managing our progress uh, with our code. OK, so we've been asked to write some functionality and we have an issue. Well, the next question is, do we actually need to write any code? It is quite common for feature requests to come in for things that actually your code already does. It's just that the person that's asking for that feature isn't aware of it. And if it turns out that, well, actually that feature is already in your uh, program, uh, quite likely the answer isn't to go and develop it a second time. Uh, it may be that you need to do a better job of communicating uh, that feature. It may be that you need to see if that feature is quite what the user really wants. Um, but you don't necessarily need to just blindly go, well, I've got a ticket that says to develop it again, so I'm going to write it again. Um, so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And um, this next bit that I'm going to introduce you to uh, comes from something called extreme programming. And uh, it is a, a particular pattern of test driven development uh, where what he suggests, uh, and apologies for my bad visual pun of the guy programming on the tightrope, um, extreme programming tries to take the practices that everybody thinks are a good idea in development and what happens if we take them to extremes. What happens if we don't just have tests, we write the tests first? What happens if we're not just testing occasionally, we're testing all the time. If we're not just integrating our work, we're integrating our work all the time. And although extreme programming as a term has a little bit faded from the consci uh, consciousness, you won't hear it around as much as perhaps you used to. The reason isn't because it's gone out of fashion. The reason is because many of its practices have become so commonplace um, that they no longer need the extreme programming tag. It's just, well, actually, those are just good practices. That's what people do. 
and we will see uh, some more of those as we as we um, progress through through the videos. So test driven development. Um, part of the idea is that you write your tests before you write your code. And the idea is, well, you've been asked to do, you know, we, you've been asked to implement some functionality. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to write a test to see whether our code has that functionality. And uh, generally speaking, for something that we want to develop, that test should fail. And I've marked that in red because most things will mark a failing test in red. Uh, if, it, if it turns out that we write our, the test for our feature and it passes, well, our code already does that. Nothing to do. Done. Just commit the, commit the test. Yep. Let's just keep, make sure that that's still working. Uh, but we don't need to develop the, um, the feature any further. It works. Um, the next stage is to write some code that is going to make that test passed. And in test-driven development, they kind of say, well, the, sec the next stage is, for the moment, just somehow make the test pass. Just write code that does it. And all right, you'll be thinking a bit about quality, but don't fuss too much to start with about the quality. Make the code pass. And then, once you've got something that works, tidy up the design which is called, uh, sometimes called refactoring. We'll see two meanings of the word refactor. There's a big meaning of the word and there's a very specific meaning of the word refactor. Um, but so this process, writing a test that should fail, marked in red, making that test pass, so it's now marked in green, and then refactoring the code, um, that tends to get nicknamed red-green refactor. And that is the process that test-driven development suggests. Uh, now, I should mention, however, that if you try to do this, you will often find that actually you don't quite write the tests first. You end up starting to go and write the tests. But as you get start writing that test and you're saying, well, I want to call such and such a method and you're starting to have to think about what parameters you're giving it. Um, well, in doing so, you're doing a bit of design about what the code's going to be like because you are writing something that um, is going to make some calls and you're going to need to then go and write the code uh, in the classes in the actual code base to accept those calls. So when you're writing those tests, you're kind of doing a little bit of design work. And so very often you'll find yourself, you start with the test and you kind of flick across and you start sketching out what the code should look like a bit and you realize you go back to the test and you write a bit more of it and then you go back to the code and you realize, ooh, actually, um, no, that's maybe not the best way of doing it. I'll just change that a little bit and then go back to the test to change how that works in the test. So sometimes they, they, they go somewhat hand in hand in many developers experience um, but this um, I guess mantra of red green refactor trying to write the test first thinking at least about the test first um, encourages a a model of development that um, does lots of testing which is good because then you get to see uh, when someone has broken your code and remember that in this unit as you are all working on the code base together it is quite possible that someone else will come along later and break your code and there's a bit of a difference depending upon whether you've written a test or not because if you wrote a test they broke your code the tests were failing when they committed their code well they've committed code that fails the test they they really ought to fix that up whereas if you've written some code but you haven't written tests for your code and they do some stuff that breaks their code, but there's no test for it. They have no way of knowing that they've broken your stuff. And so they're going to, you know, they're going to commit their work. They're going to have broken your stuff. And there is going to be a sense in which, well, actually, it's incumbent on you now to go and fix that because you really ought to have put a test in um, to make sure your stuff was working. Otherwise, there was no possible way that your colleague could know that was breaking. Um, OK. That talks a little about, you know, writing the code of the tests and a little bit about when we write the code of the tests. Um, but what's the data that we are going to pass into the code in our tests? It's one thing to say that we are going to go and call all the way back here. Ooh, going further and further, further back. Where was it? And here we go. Flooper dot floop. It's one thing to say my code is going to call flooper.floop, but if floop takes a parameter, well, what values should I put into that parameter? 
And here again, I'm going to say that please remember that what we are trying to do is we are trying to catch bugs. And so we want to try to pass in the sorts of values that will help us to know if there is a certain kind of bug in there. Now, I would like to introduce this, the concept to you of equivalence classes. And this isn't a concept that I'm going to strictly define. It's one that I'm going to introduce by example. And I'm going to say, suppose we were writing code that was all about birthdays. What values should I pass into my tests for birthdays? Well, perhaps one value I might choose just for the sake of choosing a value to pass in might be the 12th of December 2008. And so I pass that in as a value and I make the, the test work when, it, uh, when the code uh, is given that value the 12th of December 2008. OK, you know, 12th of December 2008, perfectly valid date, a um, little while in the past, not terribly far in the past. All right. Well, what if I was to pass in the 17th of August 2011? Well, that's kind of possibly roughly equivalent to the 12th of December 2008. It, you know, they're both valid dates. It should work for both of them. There's, there, there's nothing that, uh, that you would notice as being uh, especially special about those, apart from they're in different months and they're different days and different years, but they're, they're both, you know, perfectly reasonable as dates. Um, However, what if instead of the 17th of August, I was to pass in the 71st of August 2011? Well, then my code should probably behave differently because there isn't a 71st of August 2011. That's a typo. I've swapped the numbers around. And so that is quite clearly a different sort of date. It's one of the edge cases that, um, that I may need to deal with. Someone has submitted a day that doesn't have you know doesn't that 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 day doesn't exist what about the 31st of july 2011 and this is where people go oh hang on hang on 30 days have september april june and november no, no it's okay the 31st of july does exist well yes but the fact that you had to think through the poem to realize that kind of makes you realize that this is one of those ones that people could get wrong this is sort of the edge case of let's try and catch the bug for what if they've not set up quite correctly whether it's june or july that has 31 days in it um, likewise, you could pick up the other edge case of um, 31st of August 2011. 30 days have September, April, June and, no and November, etc. Um, so we, we could start to have a look at um, months that shouldn't have a 30th or months that should, uh, sorry, shouldn't have a 31st or months that should have a 31st. Um, what about the 29th of February 2012? Ooh, have to think on that one. Yep, yep. Uh, there was a leap year. That does exist. But so this is the equivalence card class of, well, does it handle leap years correctly? Because, OK, 29th of Febru February 2012 exists, but the 29th of February 2011 doesn't. And um, those are the sorts of bugs that we might make. Um, so when we write our tests and we are testing things, uh, it's not simply a mechanical exercise. It's not one that you can do unthinkingly. It is one where you think about the, uh, you know, where might the bugs be lurking in how someone has implemented this. Uh, but we try and write a lot of unit tests. We try and write a smaller number of integration tests, for instance. And the other thing I kind of wanted to suggest is that um, tests end up having a really useful secondary purpose. Um, the tests are a specification by example of how your code should behave. Um, when you've written the test of, you know, this is how it should work when it works, well, you have documented how to call your code in a way that is verifiable. Um, someone else reading this test can know, yes, that is how to call your code. And I know that's how you're to call your code. And I know that it works for how to call your code because the test runs and passes. And that proves to me that if I follow that formula, that is how to call your code. And so when you are working in teams and you are writing code that is going to be used by other people, it is really very useful to make one of the, at least one of the tests that you have, pretty well documented and um, 
fairly 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 obvious in your code give it a, an obvious name um, that shows how to call your code correctly so that the groups who are going to be working with your code know how to call your code okay that was a fairly brief introduction to um, testing um, testing is something that there, there, there's quite a lot of um, there's a lot of research there's a lot of experience there's a lot of industry experience in terms of um, how we go about testing our code and there's some other tools that we're going to come across around testing uh, one of them being about mocks and stubs and another being around test coverage metrics of how well how well covered is our code by our tests